So today the world is, uh, is remembering the life of an extraordinary man, uh, Nelson Mandela. And I wanted to start this session just by having us join in the global commemoration and celebration of, of his life. Um, several years ago, I read Mandela's autobiography, which is a remarkable book. It made a very deep impression on me. Um, and Mandela was brilliant, and, and his intellectual force and his eloquence just leapt out, it leaps out from the pages of his autobiography, which I recommend to anybody. Um, but I think that brilliance alone would not have left such a deep impression. Um, what struck me most is that Nelson Mandela emerged from 27 years of captivity without bitterness. And I don't know that I know anyone who could emerge from 27 years of captivity without bitterness. He says in the autobiography, he says, if bitterness would have helped me in the struggle, I would have been bitter. At that force of character bent the arc of history. Now, so Mandela's specific contributions were, were not in the area of energy, but here's the link I'd like to draw to today's session, which is Mandela made the impossible possible. When I was a student, when I was in college, I remember clearly everybody believed that when apartheid was finally overthrown, and we all knew that one day apartheid would be overthrown, but we all thought when apartheid is overthrown, there will be massive bloodshed. Uh, in the streets of South Africa. And it, it was seen as a transition cost, inevitable, something that would happen. But Mandela prevented that from happening. Mandela, you can look back now and it seems as if what happened was preordained, but it wasn't. It was the force of what Mandela did that made it happen. So I want to just keep in mind this theme as we go into today's discussion about making the impossible possible because what today's session is all about is, is two, I think, very interesting converging trends around the world. The first is the remarkable growth of renewable energy. Um, this renewable revolution is sweeping the world. Just in the past five years, the prices of solar power have dropped more than 80% globally. So photovoltaic panels are now economic in many places where they weren't just five years ago, and those prices are projected to come down even more, uh, almost 50% in the years ahead. In the United States, in my country, in the past couple of years, we've had more wind power capacity additions than any other energy technology, uh, including natural gas, which is a big revolution. I was in China last week. In China, they told me there was more wind power produced last year than nuclear power. So this this renewable revolution is, is sweeping the planet. And then we have a second trend, which is the growth in Latin America and the Caribbean. The IDB projects that this region will need 300% of its current electric generating capacity within the course of the next couple of decades. That's a remarkable growth. Now, this region already has the highest percentage of renewable power in the world with its massive hydropower resources, but the potential is even bigger. The solar resources, the wind resources, the geothermal resources in this hemisphere are extraordinary. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we have a, we have a tremendous panel. Um, uh, I wanted to, so let me in, in, invite to the stage then our tremendous panelists, starting with um, Ambassador Vince Henderson, um, who is Dominica's permanent representative to the United Nations, and we're thrilled to have him here. And our second panelist is Lizeth Zuniga, the Executive Director of the Renewable Energy Association of Nicaragua. And our third panelist is my old friend, delighted to have him here, Rolando Gonzalez Bunster, the President, CEO, and Chairman of InterEnergy Partners. So Ambassador Henderson, let me start with you. Uh, and Dominica has some very uh, ambitious goals for renewable energy. Some might even call them impossible. Um, could you tell us about Dominica's renewable resources and your goals and how you're planning on accomplishing them? Thank you very much. Well, the island of Dominica, not to be mistaken for the Dominican Republic, um, we have set ourselves a lofty goal 
of achieving carbon negative by 2020. Now that is something that stops someone and say, how are you gonna do that? Currently, we generate about 30% of our electricity from hydro. So hydropower has been in operation for over 20 years in Dominica. For the past 10 years, we've started the development of geothermal energy. And we have the capacity to provide for domestic supply, but also the possibility of exporting to the French territories of Guadeloupe and Martinique, which are only about 20 miles away um, from the north of Dominica and the south of Dominica. Their demands are 10 times more than Dominica's demand. So we have the potential to export power to these islands, and therefore we're in a position to meet that goal by 2020. And what do you think are the main barriers to accomplish this? What is it going to take to get it done? Well, one of the main things that we need to move this process forward is partnership. And we have been working with a French consortium to develop the export part of the project. So far, we have done our own investments through grants and some loan financing. And we are now currently drilling the production wells for the domestic plant, which initially will be seven megawatts, and then we will, we will scale it up. We hope that our partners from the French, um, the French consortium will be able to give a commitment by the first quarter of 2014. We are being ably assisted by the Clinton Climate Initiative, um, especially Ira Magazinger, who is our main advisor, and therefore we depend on that partnership to move forward. Well, thank you. Let's, let's move to Nicaragua, which is another country that has some very ambitious goals for renewable energy. Liza, could you tell us about your country's goals and what the plans are? Muy buena. Muy buenos días. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad ¿verdad? de participar aquí. Felicidades a, a los organizadores. Sí, en el caso de Nicaragua es un caso, diríamos, muy especial porque, como muy bien decía, ha sido un auge en las energías renovables. Eh, hace cinco años no es lo que está pasando ahora. Eh, hemos cambiado la, la, la matriz energética, se ha venido cambiando paulatinamente. Y los lo objetivos de gobierno y a nivel país es llegar a un 90% en el 2027. Entonces, ¿cómo lo podemos lograr? Sí se puede lograr porque tenemos capacidades altas. Nosotros tenemos 4.500 megawatts eh, de energía disponible, potenciales ya estudiados, confirmados, más allá de lo que se puede investigar e indagar más. Entonces, eh, sí hay posibilidades, hay recursos, hay eh, mucha voluntad política, hay un reglamento pues claro, un marco jurídico que apoya las energías renovables, hay muchos incentivos. Entonces, sí creemos que, que se puede lograr. ¿Cuáles son los desafíos? ¿Qué hacer en el sistema interconectado nacional con esa energía que vamos a producir? Eh, porque supera casi nueve veces el consumo interno. Entonces, por eso es que se está dando la o se está... Eh, iniciando, potenciando, eh, fortaleciendo la integración centroamericana para ser un mercado común. Thank you very much. Could you just say a word about the the legal framework and the policy framework? You said it's very supportive of renewable energy. Just explain what that means for the crowd. Efectivamente, eh, hay un estudio muy interesante que el Climascopio, que es este, financiado por el BID, el FOMIN, eh, ellos el año pasado eh, ubicaron a Nicaragua en, el segun, en la segunda posición de 26 países latinoamericanos en, en un clima de negocio favorable para invertir en Nicaragua, en energías renovables. ¿verdad? En este año eh, pasó al tercer lugar de los 26 países. Eso tiene que ver que uno de los indicadores es el marco legal y regulatorio. ¿Por qué? Porque existe eh, política, existen leyes que apoyan al inversionista, apoyan la inversión que se llega a hacer, por supuesto, también porque hay una ley que en Centroamérica es el único país que tiene una ley de incentivos, la ley 532, que incentiva precisamente a los proyectos de energía renovable. Entonces, hay un marco regulatorio favorable a, esta, a, a todas las eh, fuentes de generación de energía renovable. By the way, one of the reasons I asked is because this is a growing debate in my country, in the United States. There is big discussion among utilities about the incentive programs for solar um, and, and a lot of support 
interesting bipartisan support in my country for maintaining some of those solar uh, init uh, supports in, in, uh, in, uh, around, the, around the nation. Let me turn to Rolando. Um, and you have worked hard to um, uh, build a wind farm in Dominican Republic, not to be confused with Dominica. Uh, and uh, I know it wasn't always easy, um, but I think the turbines are now spinning. And I wondered if you could just tell us about the experience. Well, uh, thank you, David, and thank you to all the CGI staff for a wonderful event. Uh, my odyssey in the, in the wind uh, projects in the Dominican Republic started in the late uh, 1990s uh, when we started measuring uh, for wind in the uh, eastern tip of the island and started with a project that was going to be 10 megawatts. Uh, then came a hurricane, George, and knocked down our towers, and it took us a while to get back up. But at the beginning of the new, de the new millennium, uh, we did all our wind studies, got them certified, and then also measured for wind in the western part of the country, in the southwestern part of the country, and were able to get very good wind results. We got them certified and we decided to start with our pilot project, a 10 megawatt facility. We bought five uh, Vestas turbines, uh, got all kinds of permits from the government. At that time, there was no legislation for renewable energy, but we got every permit from every organization, including the, the Dominican Navy, the Park Services, the Environmental Commissions, the Presidency, Public Works Ministry. And even the president signed a decree about it. Then comes a change of government. The, uh, the, uh, the windmills arrive in port. We, it was an investment of $22 million, IFC financing. And for five years, those windmills stayed in the port because the Minister of Tourism objected to those windmills being installed in the area where they had been uh, projected to be installed, which was the eastern tip of the Dominican Republic. And that uh, area, the alleged reason they gave us for not having it installed there was that there was going to be a $400 million investment in the windiest part of the island, which never happened anyway. But anyway, for five years, those windmills uh, stayed at the port at a cost of over $30,000 a month just in storage fees. <laughs> In addition to that, we were paying interest on the loans. Our equity was at risk. So we negotiated a very long, drawn-out process, a deal with the Dominican government, and got them to agree that those windmills could be installed in the second site. And on October 2011, those windmills and another 30 megawatts became part of the second phase of our project, and then we added another 50 megawatts. So today we have a, around 92 megawatts of installed capacity spinning at around 38% of the time. We're giving us 30%, 38% yield. And the project is a highly profitable, highly, uh, I mean, it, it really replaces enormous amounts of carbon. And um, one of the key issues here is that infrastructure and equipment are very crucial to doing this. Uh, these windmills are very heavy, they're 80 meters high. Uh, we had to create a port, build a port to bring them in. We were paying 100, no, I'm sorry, $10,000 a day for two big cranes. Each crane was costing us $10,000 a day. We had to bring them from Germany to install the windmills. So. Whenever you think of these big projects, you have to consider, and I know uh, from the Nicaraguan experience, because I, a very good friend of mine developed the first uh, 40 megawatt wind farm in Nicaragua, uh, and uh, he had similar logistical issues. But you have to consider that logistics is, a, is, a, is one of the key elements. And a lot of the islands that are the best sources of, uh, islands in the Caribbean that are the best sources for uh, wind and solar, are, you know, and also have very high energy prices, so you don't really need subsidies. Uh, these areas 
have a, a lot of uh, logistical constraints. They have uh, land constraints, and so it, 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 it is a very interesting process that you have to go through, and it's not as easy as people think, you know, to build these, these, things, these projects. Well, thank you for your persistence, uh, and we're glad it's paying off. Could maybe just elaborate on the, f on the financing, because it was obviously a challenge, and you mentioned, I think, IFC. Um, what role did multilateral institutions and others play in this? Well, in, in our particular case, uh, the first project was financed by the IFC. Uh, in, in, the sec in the expansions, uh, our company did it through internal uh, resources because we, we would issue bonds in the local market rather than go to, to the multilaterals uh, and, and, and wait. It, it was odd easier for us, given the low interest rates in the United States, to access capital in the local market. And, you know, we, we would pay around 5%, seven-year money, and uh, which rolls over in interest only. So it, it, it's really an effective way to finance. Uh, InterEnergy uh, has now as, as a partner, they own 20% of our company, the IFC. So we are now looking at two projects. One uh, that will be the largest wind power project in uh, Central America, in Panama. It's going to be uh, 215 megawatts, and there the IFC will play a role as an investor and as a financier. We also are developing a 40 megawatt solar project in Panama, uh, where the off-taker is the University of Panama. We get very good uh, sovereign guarantee from the government of Panama and a two-year letter of revolving letter of credit from the Panamanian government. Uh, I mean, from the Panamanian, uh, the University of Panama, which is a, a state university. So it is very important that, for me, I, I always found that if you have clear rules, you can get the financing. If you have a compelling project and the alternatives are more expensive, you'll get the financing. What really murkies up everything is when rules and, and laws and regulations are not clear. And that was the initial problem we had in the Dominican Republic because nobody knew who was in charge at the time and everybody, you know, there was a time when the, the, the new environment, uh, the uh, renewable energy law had not been passed. So it, it created a, a, a very difficult, you know, situation for us. Mr. Ambassador, do you know offhand how much does electricity cost in Dominica today? Well, last year uh, we paid five times what you would normally pay in the U.S. Um, it's about 52 U.S. cents per kilowatt hour now. And um, I know, but in some, in some islands, it gets as high as 80 cents. Um, I'm also the chairman of the Renewable Energy Initiative for Small Island Development States. And some of our members pay a significant amount just for one kilowatt hour. In Dominica's case, although we have hydro, so we don't have to pay the high fuel import um, cost, we still are subjected to high cost of electricity. So the intention is to use geothermal energy to reduce that significantly. We have done um, the economics of the plant and we have seen clearly that we will have a reduction, a significant reduction in the cost of energy. You mentioned you're chairman of a group called the Small Island Developing States. Could you just tell us about that? What, what is that group? Well, it's an organization called SIDSDA. It's an initiative by small island developing states that are sovereign states. And so far, we have 31 members. The objective of that organization is to assist our members to develop renewable energy projects and energy efficiency projects. We so far have received over $30 million from the government of Denmark and the government of Japan. And we have also established agreements, cooperation agreements with several international organizations, including the Clinton Climate Initiative, we have been able to sign up with IRENA as well so that we can collaborate with IRENA in the small island states because we recognize that the peculiarities of small island states is something that has to be taken into account when developing projects for them. One of the, one of the areas that we also 
emphasize on is policy. And, and clearly, from what Rolando said, the experience in the Dominican Republic, we have placed great emphasis on getting the rules right. Most of, of the islands don't have laws um, to encourage the growth of renewable energy. There are still monopolistic situations. The electric utility have monopolies, and some of them have that for about 50 years. And what we found is that it is difficult to get independent power producers in renewable energy to get involved in the, in the supply of energy. The electric utilities, on the other hand, sometimes are very reluctant to engage in renewable energy. But um, we have worked with a number of our governments. Our friends from the CCI also have assisted us. And we have established great relations with some of, the, of, um, of those producers. And hopefully, we can see a turnaround in most of the island states. Uh, it's extraordinary that about 52 cents a kilowatt hour and, and solar is 10 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. The, the barrier is not cost, right? There, the, there are other barriers that you're dealing with. Well, clearly, clearly. Like I said, the rules, as I would like to emphasize the point that was made earlier, the rules are important. Incentives are important. But what we found out as well is that leadership is critical. Mm. We need a leader. We need someone to champion this through, someone who will be continually pushing it and will help to get the private sector involved. So what, what we've also found out is that there's a lot of money out there, a lot of great project ideas, but the connection with the private sector, the investors, and the governments, there seem to be a gap. And what we're trying to do, even in our organization, is to make that connection. So we don't only deal with governments, but we try to encourage private companies to get involved in the development of renewable energy projects in the islands. In our case, clearly, without the leadership of our Prime Minister, we would not have been able to move this far with geothermal development. Thank you. Liza, I wanted to talk specifically for a moment about access to energy for the poor. And um, around the world, more than a billion people lack access to electricity and basic energy services. Um, and, and there's Interesting comparisons are sometimes made between cell phones and solar panels. Um, 20, more than 20 years ago, actually the day that Bill Clinton was inaugurated as president in 1993, there were 15 million cell phones on the planet. And today there are more than 6 billion cell phones on the planet. A and in many countries, uh, the landline telephone network was never built and those countries move directly to cell phones. And I, I wonder, in your country, is there much off-grid solar today? And do you see that as a growing segment of, um, of the market in Nicaragua? Sí, efectivamente es un punto muy importante el acceso de la energía a los pobres. Ahorita casualmente es una iniciativa del programa Naciones Unidas, este, eh, CIFUROL, que es la iniciativa del de acceso a la energía de los pobres. Entonces ello eh, está implementándose varias actividades, en el caso de Nicaragua, pues uno de los más avanzados, dichosamente, eh, donde se hizo el RRA, que es la evaluación de las energías renovables. Entonces nos permite tener un mapeo actual de cómo están todas las fuentes de energía renovable para, para ver su plan de acción, el plan de acción hasta el 2020, ¿verdad? Entonces, en el caso de la telefonía, este, sí, hablamos que eh, nosotros hemos avanzado muchísimo a hablar de acceso a la energía. Todavía tenemos un 30, más de 30% de la población que eh, no tiene acceso a la energía, pero en los últimos cinco años pues, ha habido un avance impresionante, pasar del 50% al 70%, eh, es decir, bastante, ¿verdad? Entonces, eso eh, nace principalmente de los programas de gobierno. Ahorita, actualmente, se está desarrollando un programa nacional de electricidad sostenible y energía renovable, donde incluye dos componentes dirigidos precisamente a, a la electrificación rural y a la ampliación de la conexión de la red, ¿verdad? de la red de transmisión. Entonces, en esto va incluido precisamente lo que usted decía, que son eh, la tecnología de eh, solar fotovoltaico, que es una de las más 
accesible en cuanto a, a llevar el acceso, valga la aclaración, no necesariamente a los costos, porque los costos siguen siendo este, mayores, aunque eh, si lo comparamos a no tener electricidad, pues efectivamente es un resultado, es un buen resultado. Entonces, sí, eh, nosotros estamos eh, eh, contribuyendo o trabajando mucho en, en garantizar eh, que toda la población Tenga, que toda la población tenga energía en los próximos años, ¿verdad? Nuestra meta es llegar al 90%, al menos en el 2018, para que, para precisamente para lograr esta comunicación, que es muy importante, eh, otra de, la, de las fuentes de energía que se utilizan, o que estamos utilizando o apoyando en el país, son la, eh, la hidroeléctrica, las pequeñas centrales hidroeléctricas, que también vienen a ser una contribución grande a estas, a esta, a estas comunidades. Entonces, pero más allá de la comunicación, tiene que ver toda la dinamización de la economía local, porque lo vemos desde un punto también de vista de uso productivo de la, de la electricidad, entonces tratar de ver este, lo que son los emprendedurismos verdes o la cadena de valor, entonces no solo hablar que la energía es el fin, sino la energía es el medio para dinamizar la economía, entonces más allá de la comunicación, que es muy importante, también es crear fuentes de trabajo en las comunidades. You used a very interesting phase, phrase, which is green entrepreneurship. Are, are people making money developing renewable power in Nicaragua today? Is, is it profitable to be uh, in the renewable energy business? And I know you're an economist by training. Are you seeing people actually making money in renewable energy in Nicaragua? Sí, bueno, más viéndola desde los dos puntos de vista, volvemos, ¿verdad? Este, uno es de la dinamización de la economía local. Entonces, si dinamizamos una economía local, obviamente el, la comunidad, la localidad se beneficia, pero también el país se beneficia, viéndolo desde ese punto de vista. Y viéndolo desde el punto de vista del inversionista, pues efectivamente, porque hay mucha potencialidad en recursos humanos, en recursos bueno, recursos humanos no calificados, valga la aclaración, no necesariamente tenemos los calificados, pero sí hay mano de obra barata, que es una de, la, de las este, oportunidades que hay en Nicaragua, pero y sí, y sí hay posibilidades de inversión. Entonces, sí tenemos las fuentes, sí tenemos capacidad, sí tenemos los recursos humanos, entonces sí es un, un, un negocio rentable. Ahorita, pues tenemos empresas grandes, que la empresa, o los proyectos grandes no, se, no necesariamente son los que garantizan la, la electricidad en las comunidades aisladas, no necesariamente, pero contribuyen a mejorar el país. Entonces está el gobierno y la sociedad civil también, los organismos de cooperación, que son los que más aportan a lo que es la electricidad en las zonas rurales. So Rolando, on the topic of business, um, uh, you tell an interesting story, it's not an easy one. If, if a business colleague came to you and said they were interested in developing renewable energy in Latin America, what would you say to them about the opportunities and the challenges? Well, it, it, one thing you have to make sure is that um, in most systems you cannot put more than 15 to 20% renewable because uh, the system will not operate well because of constraints and, and, you know, since renewable energy is not a constant, it happens in waves or in the case of solar, it's certain hours a day. Uh, it's hard to regulate these systems. So the, I've always been told that 15 to 20 is the guideline. Um, if somebody came with a project, I think you have to look at it. I mean, uh, most countries have really become, today in Latin America, uh, very well developed in the areas of regulation and uh, promotion of renewable energy. I think there's not a country in Latin America today that doesn't have a renewable energy law, that doesn't have the incentives. Um, some countries are better than others because, for instance, a country that probably has the greatest wind resources in Latin America, or even solar, which is Argentina, is probably the worst country to go invest in because they don't have a free exchange rate, they have all kinds of funny ways they pay for the energy, they have a very deficit-ridden energy sector, and it wouldn't be an attractive investment there, although technically it would probably be the best. Uh, other countries, uh, the Caribbean and Central America, are compelling cases for developing uh, renewable energy because the alternative, as was mentioned by the ambassador, the alternative of the uh, grid price is very, very high. So if you can generate power 
at 14, 15 cents with a, with a say a, at least a 20% IRR uh, in solar or wind, the, the alternative is very good. Now there is a somewhat of a resistance sometimes by the utilities in allowing you to take that whole difference. Obviously they would buy the power at a little bit over what your profitable margin is and they would make the difference or lower the cost of energy to the population. We are looking at an interesting case which is the island of Grenada where the electric utility is, is up for sale. And in the island of Grenada, the total demand of the system is about 30 megawatts. And that 30 megawatts requires uh, that the system can only take maybe five or six megawatts of renewable. That being the case, uh, renewable energy can only have a small impact, but the price in the island of Grenada is very high. So for the, whoever acquired the, the uh, the utility there, it, it would be compelling. Uh, the out islands, or the, what they call the family islands in the Bahama chain, they are very, I mean, the, 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 the electricity rate in the Bahamas is 50 cents. And this is prevalent throughout the Caribbean. You see very high utility rates. So there, it's very compelling to uh, get into, it'd be even compelling to buy utilities, small utilities, and, and, and then bring the price down by you've been able to control what is the demand. Uh, Grand Cayman, for example, 52 cent power. They just uh, announced uh, that 10 megawatts will be uh, renewable. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, maybe that's probably all the system can take at this time. So it, it is a compelling story. You know, one way of handling this high renewables load um, and, and small islands is, or is interconnection. Um, and you mentioned this briefly, Ambassador Henderson, in, in your comments, but could you just elaborate on the plans right now in the Caribbean for interconnection among the islands? Yeah, well, also I, I just wanted to note that it is the intermittent renewable energy sources that limit the amount you could put on the grid, and also the fact that most of the islands, the grids are old, um, inefficient, and in order to move to really to, to, to integrate renewables onto the grid, most of them need upgrades, need to move into smart grids, and that, that, you know, that takes some investment. We also assist in our members um, in the Caribbean, the Pacific, as well as in the Indian Ocean to develop smart grids, to stabilize their grids, and to ensure that they can take intermittent supply of renewable energy. In the case of countries like islands like Dominica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, hydro is easier because it's stable um, and we can have the, the base load that we need. The same thing for geothermal. There are also about three other Caribbean countries that have potential for geothermal energy. So they may be able to move beyond the 20% um, because they would have base load. In our case, the, the base load of geothermal, because it is so good, we have to now consider what we do with the extra, um, the excess. And this is why interconnection is, is, is important. Now, interconnection is not easy for the entire Caribbean because when we did earlier, we did a feasibility, pre-feasibility study um, over a year ago, was concluded by the World Bank. And SIDSDOC, we we're also able to partner with the World Bank in this initiative. We found out that it may not be a viable option for some islands because of the barometrics that they found out just looking at the depths of the ocean and so forth and the connections that they will need, the cost of the interconnection. But interconnection is, in fact, a viable proposition for countries like Dominica, with our neighbors being so close. Um, perhaps Grenada might have some possibility with Barbados and some other islands that have the, the kind of conditions that would make it a viable proposition. But yes, definitely interconnection is something that we're looking at. Uh, I'd just like to add something which is very... Uh you know, for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's been an odyssey for some time. Uh, Dominican Republic has installed capacity of about 3,000 megawatts, and peak demand is under, just slightly under 2,000 megawatts. Uh, the Dominican has been moving very fast, and it started when President Leonel Fernandez, back in the, uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, passed 
the capitalization law and new plants were installed and those plants became very efficient. Since then, more plants have been coming online and, and we just were involved in the inauguration of very state-of-the-art uh, Wartzilla powered dual fuel uh, generation. There is the possibility the Dominican will be converting over a thousand megawatts to natural gas within the next year and a half. That will sort of uh, make not dispatchable over 1,500 megawatts of very good power. That, for $50 million, we can interconnect Haiti to the Dominican Republic and provide Haiti with a, you know, a, a menu of power plants that they can get power at less than what it would ever cost them to generate. And at the same time, that would open up the, the Dominican market gets larger by having uh, Haiti interconnected, which I don't see any reason why anybody would oppose that, but we've had some uh, dissenting voices that sometimes go beyond practicality and uh, reason. You mentioned natural gas. In the United States, we've had this natural gas revolution, and there's a discussion about whether natural gas is good for renewables or bad for renewables. Sometimes it competes against renewables, but sometimes, as you were just saying, Rolando, it can be used to firm up renewables or complement renewables. Any thoughts on that? Well, the price of natural gas in the U.S. is very cheap. The price of natural gas in the Caribbean is not that cheap. So what we propose is to create a, a terminal that will import gas from the United States. Now, that brings natural gas to the United to the Dominican Republic in the area of 10 to 12 cents a million BTUs with a cost of 4 cents at Henry Hub. I mean, $4 at Henry Hub, you have the, uh, the charges that uh, liquefaction and transport create on that, add to that. So uh, that means that a very efficient power plant can generate power, uh, just the energy side, at 10 cents a kilowatt. 10 cents a kilowatt, add on to that capacity and O&M, and, and, o and, M, and you're at 14 cent power. 14 cent power competes nicely with solar. I mean, it, 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 it supports solar and, and, it, and, uh, and, and wind, which I think the, the, the levelized price of solar and wind is, should be around 15, 16 cents. Uh, 